Hi, my name is Rabbi Shalom Bachner. This is a slideshow about the Holocaust, what is called in Hebrew, the Shoah. I want to say up front, it's difficult material. It's hard for me to share some of these details, and I certainly understand that it may be hard to hear some of this information. What I've discovered in my life is sometimes what's most difficult may also be what's most important. I'm sure a number of you recognize this picture. This is Anne Frank. And many people first encounter information and stories about the Holocaust through her eyes. But here's the thing to understand when you're reading her diary. She wasn't a professional author. She was just a little girl. She was writing only for herself. And I actually imagine she might be fairly embarrassed to understand that her diary, her personal words, have become the most read diary in the entire world. Other people sometimes learn about the Holocaust by reading Night by Elie Wiesel. And as you're reading these books, what's so important to understand is that there were so many other people, millions of people, impacted by the stories of hate and mass murder. So I want to explain a little bit about who was Anne Frank's family. Who is my family? Who exactly are the Jews? Judaism is the world's oldest monotheistic faith. It dates back almost 4,000 years ago. Judaism was the inspiration for Christianity and Islam. Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew, and Muhammad was influenced by Jewish beliefs. But despite being an ancient religion, we are a tiny minority of the world. And whenever you're studying a story of persecution, it's almost always a story of what happens to the minority. So let's compare. Christianity is about one-third of the world's population, and Islam represents about one-fifth of the world's population. So these two Abrahamic faiths make up more than half the world. But Judaism represents one five-hundredth of the world's population. There are only about 14 million Jews in the world today. And Judaism is both a religion and an ethnicity or culture. Many Jews identify as secular, agnostic, or atheist. Jews are an incredibly diverse people. But one thing we're not is a race. Many scientists today debate if there is such a thing called race. Those that believe that there is this construction say that certain groups of people share physical features that make them part of a group. But you can't tell someone is Jewish by looking at them. Not all Jews, for example, have curly black hair. Not all Jews have a prominent nose. There was a group of people that said you can tell someone is Jewish by looking at them and looking at their blood. And I'm referring to the Nazis. And this is both hateful and ignorant. Because Jews have the same blood as everyone else in the world. Because everyone in the world is actually related. Yes, there are different blood types, A, B, positive, negative, O. I'm not actually sure what some of those letters mean. But I guarantee you, if you looked at my blood under a microscope, it doesn't have little stars of David. The first Jews are from the Middle East, the land known as Israel, Judea, Palestine, or Canaan. But today, Jews live all over the world and speak dozens of languages. And Jews are not all white. The Jews of Africa look African. The Jews of India look Indian. The Jews of South America look South American. As a religion, we are based on the teachings of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. It's a very complex and beautiful faith. Jewish culture has always honored literacy, education, and making the world a better place. I guess you can say we're a bit of, we're a bit, we could be accused of being overachievers. 900 or more people have been awarded the Nobel Prizes, more than 200 of them, more than 22% are Jews, although we are 0.2% of the world's population. So what exactly is the Holocaust, and why do we care? Why would you care, particularly if you're not Jewish? The Holocaust was the deliberate murder of 6 million 
Jewish men, women, and children at the hands of the most culturally and scientifically advanced nation of its day only 80 years ago. One third of all Jews alive at that time were murdered. This included about 1.5 million children, people Anne Frank's age, and in some cases, younger. What does it mean to be 0.2% of the world's population and have one third of your people, 90% of the Jews that lived in Europe, murdered? Particularly understanding that the country responsible for this is so similar to the way the United States is seen today. The world looks to the United States for culture, for technology, for the latest Hollywood movies and fashions. But that was the role that Germany played in the 1930s in the world. The world looked to them for leadership. And yet somehow, this advanced nation was able to murder millions of innocent people. This next point is so important. Yes, the setting of the Holocaust was World War II, but the Jews were not killed as enemy combatants. They posed absolutely no threat to the Nazis. They were unarmed residents of Germany and Poland and other European countries. They were killed because they were Jews, and the Nazis had blamed the Jews for all of Germany's problems. They were scapegoated. They were othered. They were treated as subhuman. So why would you care? Because to study the Holocaust is to learn about humanity's darkest hours of hatred, fear, and human-caused suffering. But it's also a story of bravery, of resistance, and what perhaps is the highest human trait of them all, compassion. Notice when you're reading Anne Frank or listening to this information, notice where you see the bravery, the resistance, the compassion. And finally, it's been said, those who do not learn from history are destined to repeat it. I hope that we have truly learned from this history, so no one need ever repeat this type of history. I used to refer to this as the pie graph of death, but more accurately, it's a pie graph of mass murder. Who exactly was killed in the Holocaust? Who were these 13 million people? 20% of them were Soviet prisoners of war. The German Nazis didn't capture their prisoners, they murdered them. 10%, more than a million people, were murdered because of their political beliefs or because they stood up against the Nazi ideology. Many people were murdered simply because of where they lived. As the Nazis invaded Yugoslavia, Poland, the Ukraine, and other countries, they captured the people that lived there, they murdered them and simply stole and occupied their land. 2% of the pie graph you'll notice says Roma. Today, many of these people are referred to as gypsies, murdered because they were gypsies. 1% disabled individuals, literally murdered because they were disabled. Think about that. In our society today, if someone is differently abled, we make accommodations for their transportation or their testing. The Nazi said it's not worth keeping these people alive. You might notice it says other, 1%. That largely refers to homosexuals and lesbians, people the Nazis murdered simply because they loved people of the same gender. And the largest part of this horrible pie graph are the Jews of Europe, 6 million Jews. Notice that very few of them lived in Germany. The Nazis mostly murdered people in the countries they occupied. Polish Jews, Romanian Jews, Hungarian Jews, Russian Jews. Which brings me to say a word about power. I think it's normal to be impressed by power. And there's no question that Hitler and the Nazis were extremely powerful. Hitler was a charismatic leader. When he spoke, people wanted to listen. And he was able to harness his country's frustrations, unite the people, and begin a battle for world domination. And if you're thinking, wow, that's impressive, yes, it is. But power equals responsibility. And Hitler greatly abused his power. He promised to make Germans feel proud and healed. He boasted that their Third Reich would rule the world for a thousand years. He promised he would fix all of Germany's problems. 
he promised that all Germans would live in large homes, with new cars, and all the food they would want. But in the end, he left his country in ruins. Millions of his own people died. An estimated 4.3 million German soldiers and half a million German civilians dead. He turned people against their neighbors and friends. He broke all of his promises. There were no mansions, no cars, no food security. And in the end, he killed himself rather than take responsibility for his actions. That's not power. That's being a coward. And he unleashed a hatred that still lingers to this day. A hate that we must stand on guard against. I know it's practically beyond our understanding. What does it mean six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust? How many is six million people? Well, here's one way of understanding that figure. That's roughly the entire population of the Bay Area's nine counties. Look at the slide and think of all the people that live in San Francisco, in Oakland, in San Jose, in Santa Rosa, and all the suburbs in between. Can we imagine all of those people being killed in a year or two, not due to war, not due to illness, but due to othering, due to hate? I know we cannot fully fathom that figure, so let's put it aside for a moment and talk about one person. Here's a famous picture from the Holocaust, and what do we see? A scared child. And why is he scared? We can understand. He's been taught what we've been taught, that police and soldiers are there to help us, protect us. But these soldiers are pointing their guns at him, and they're making him leave. Where is he leaving from? Possibly a home that he lived in with his family his whole life. Possibly a village that his family lived in for a thousand years. The Nazis don't care. He's Jewish. He's different. He needs to leave. Where is he going? a ghetto, a part of the city that the Nazis have designated for the people that they don't like. What happened to him next? He was likely sent to a concentration camp. What happened to him after that? We simply don't know. Different people have stepped forward and said, I knew that child, or that's me in the picture. But the reality is, we don't know what happened to this scared child. But we do know it is quite unlikely that he survived. The Jewish response to this history, this information, is two words, never again. And what you're looking at in this slide is the Holocaust Memorial today in downtown Berlin, the capital of Germany. And by never again, we mean never again for anyone. No one should ever face this kind of hate, this kind of mass murder, which is one of my motivations for putting together this slideshow. You and I seem to be living at a time that division is increasing. There's hate, there's fear, there's the threat of violence. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? It's very simple to simply say, never again. But if we don't understand what caused this, how can we possibly be part of making sure it doesn't happen again? And what caused this is othering. Maybe you're not familiar with the term. This British political cartoon represents it. It says, we're a very tolerant society, but if you don't behave like us, you can go back to where you came from. In other words, the man speaking believes that he has the right to determine who has rights and who doesn't, who belongs and who doesn't. Imagine if the slide said, you don't look like us, you don't speak like us. You don't pray like us. You don't eat like us. It doesn't matter what the issue is. The issue is that he has rights and he feels that they don't. Othering is actually quite simple. It's treating people like others. Take a look at this slide and notice the words that are related to othering. Intolerance, bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, stereotype, racism, dehumanizing, disrespect, sexism. And ask yourself, 
Have you ever been othered? Have you ever been treated as less than you deserve? Has someone ever implied, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too athletic, you're too smart, you're too poor, you're too rich, you're too female, you're too male, you're too white, too black, too something? And probably a harder but more important question, do you think you've ever othered someone else? Do you think you'd ever treated someone like they weren't good enough or cool enough? Because othering so quickly can lead to hatred, and hatred can so quickly lead to violence, and violence can lead to murder or mass murder. And that, to me, is the power of Anne Frank. Because when I read her story, I related to her. I've never been a 12-year-old girl, but I think everyone who reads her story can understand exactly what she's writing and what she's going through. She doesn't feel like history. She doesn't feel like other. And that is true of all of the people impacted by these stories. Yes, the fashions have changed. None of you would probably wear those outfits to school today. But look beyond the clothing. Look at their faces. Look at their expressions. And realize how very much like us they were. Before the sadness and struggle of war ripped their lives apart, these kids had friends. They had interests. They played music and sports. They dreamed of their future, just like we do. This kid never said, I'm being othered. He went to school. He looked for his friends. He laughed. They looked forward to winter break, just like we do. They were all part of families. They had mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, loved ones. They were real people. Some of them survived, grew up, and move to Modesto. You're looking here at Ursula Lowenbach Foster, a childhood acquaintance of Anne Frank. In fact, mentioned by name in the unabridged diary, she writes, Anne was perfectly sweet and perfectly boring. Why would she say that about Anne Frank? Why would, why would Anne Frank say that about Ursula? Because Anne Frank's, Ursula's boyfriend became Anne Frank's boyfriend. There was a rivalry between these kids. But she survived. She came to Modesto. She became a chess teacher and ultimately lived and is buried here in Modesto. How did she survive? She survived by hiding in a three foot crawl space for almost two years. She said she couldn't stand it. The dirt, the bugs, the fear, the illness. While they were living under there, two people were born under there which says a little bit about what else was going on under there in this time. Her brother was arrested and murdered in a concentration camp. The picture in the middle was taken just a few days before. That was the last time she ever saw him. Here's another face to put with the story. This man was born in Chaperon, Hungary. He was named Miklos. When he moved to English-speaking countries, he changed it to Mike or Michael. We can see he was a painting contractor. He was a funny, warm, entertaining, zany guy who loved people. If he was here right now in your room, you'd probably be late for the next class or activity because he'd want to walk up to each one of you and find out who you are. He would tell you about playing soccer as a kid and he'd want to know what were your interests. He put on funny costumes. He spoke in funny voices. And I got to know him extremely well because Mike Sinai was my stepfather, and Miklos Sinai was a survivor of the Holocaust. He died a few years ago, and since he's no longer here to tell you his story, it's my honor, it's my responsibility to tell you a little bit more about him. He was born in a beautiful medieval city called Chapron, and as he described it, we were dirt poor, but there was love in the family, and that was all that mattered. And he got into lots of childhood adventures in the city of Chaperone, growing up in this neighborhood. And he had a fairly normal childhood until his father died of disease when he was about 10 years old. His father was Hungarian, but the, the government said, you were born here, your father was born here, but your mother was born in Austria. So you have to leave. You have to go back to Austria, a country that my stepfather had never even been in. They moved to Vienna, 
a beautiful city of cafes and art and music, but there were incredible difficulties. They had no money and ultimately moved into a tiny one-room storefront apartment in the city of Vienna, which they converted from a store into a small apartment. But this is what's happening while my stepfather is growing up. Hitler was appointed chancellor in January of 1933. The 1935 Nuremberg laws included a Jew cannot be a citizen of the Reich. He cannot exercise the right to vote. He cannot hold public office. And in 1938, the Anschluss, the joining, the annexation of Austria into Nazi Germany meant that all of the rules of Nazi Germany now applied to Austria, where my stepfather and his family were living. The Nazis isolated and segregated Jews from their fellow Germans and Austrians. Jews were barred from all public schools and universities, as well as from cinemas, movies, theaters, sports facilities. In many cities, Jews were forbidden to enter designated Aryan zones. German decrees forced most Jews out of their businesses. There were curfews. Jews could not go into the parks. Jews could not ride public transportation. Jews could not go to public schools. But all of that was nothing compared to what happened next. Because my stepfather was living in Austria during what today we call Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass an organized attack against Jews carried out by paramilitary forces and civilians throughout Nazi Germany and Austria in one night of November 1938. The Nazi orders were to burn down all synagogues, Jewish houses of worship in Germany and Austria, to smash the windows of all Jewish-owned businesses. Those that tried to resist or help the Jews were to be arrested or sent to concentration camps. Some were shot on sight. And these are actual pictures of synagogues set on fire by the Nazis that night in 1938. Can you imagine what it would be to have your own house of worship, your own community center set on fire by government officials? Who do you call? You can't call the police. You can't call the fire department. Those are the people who lit the fires. But unfortunately, the synagogue burning down the street from my stepfather was the least of their worries because they were living in what looked like a Jewish-owned shop. My stepfather said he remembered this night every day of his life. All around them is the sound of broken glass, glass breaking, shouts, shots being fired, people running in the street. And suddenly he looks up and there's a Nazi soldier looking into the window of their little apartment. And he hears an older voice say, smash the window. And the younger voice, the person looking in the window, my stepfather would pause and say, his heart wasn't in it. What an interesting phrase. The younger person looking in the window said to the commanding officer, it doesn't look like a store. It, 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 in fact, I just see a mother and a couple children. And the older voice said, smash the window. Those are our orders. And the younger voice said, let's seal the door so no one can go in or out. And that's what they do. And they move to the next door. My stepfather said, that Nazi saved our lives. There was good in him. There's good in people. He didn't want to do this thing. And what would have happened, he said, had we been thrown out onto the street while people were being shot and people were being arrested? This is what happened that night. Jewish homes, hospitals, and schools were destroyed. Rioters destroyed and burned 267 synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. Over 7,000 Jewish businesses damaged or destroyed. And 30,000 Jews were arrested and incarcerated and sent to concentration camps. The mother appeals to the Red Cross, save my children. And the Red Cross responds with three Tickets for what today we call the kinder transport, an attempt to bring children out of harm's way. And these are actual pictures of children being saved in World War II. The three of them, the four of them rather, go down to the train station. But the last minute, the younger sister starts to cry. She doesn't want to go with her brothers. And the mother says, the two of you, my stepfather and his older brother, get on the train. You have to go. And they say, but what's going to happen? The mother said, we'll be fine. 
Who's going to harm a young woman and a little girl? Say goodbye to your sister. We'll write. We'll stay in touch. We'll see you soon. The war will soon be over. They say their goodbyes. The train leaves. My stepfather and his older brother eventually make it to England. They're raised in an orphanage. They do receive a letter from the Red Cross from the mother and sister, but then the letters stop. And it's not months, it's years. And there's bombs dropping on England, and there's a shortage of food, and there's great fear, and there's no word from his younger sister and mother. The older brother joins the war effort to fight the Nazis, and years later, the war is over. And my stepfather starts a desperate search what happened to his sister. What happened to his mother? What happened to his whole extended family? And eventually, after traveling through Eastern Europe, he finds a distant cousin and says, Miklos, I'm so glad you found me. There's no one left. They've all been murdered. Don't ask me any questions. They murdered your sister. They murdered your mother. They murdered everyone else. My stepfather goes back to England. He tells his older brother what he's discovered, and the older brother shot himself committed suicide. He couldn't bear to live in a world that such things could happen. My stepfather said he realized he needed to make a choice. The same hope and faith that he would see his family again would now have to be hope and faith that he could leave, li live a life of meaning. And the amazing thing is, he did it. He wasn't bitter. He was a happy man. And not only was his faith intact, but more importantly, and more impressively, his faith in humanity was intact. This man loved people, despite what people had done to his sister, his mother, and all of his family members. One more face to put with these stories. This is David Bachner, my grandfather. He's born in southern Poland. He marries my grandmother in southern Poland, and they move to Berlin. And when people said to him, David, why are you moving from Poland to Berlin? He said, ah, the Germans are sophisticated. There will be safer. My father was born in Berlin and remembers one day there being a large parade outside with soldiers and music and he wanted to go out. And his parents said, no, it's not safe. Why isn't it safe to hear a parade? Because the parade was the Nazis. This was Hitler literally marching down the streets of Berlin, just a few blocks from where my father lived. My grandfather was a tailor. In Berlin, he opened up a tailing a tailor shop that sold suits and made repairs. They lived in an apartment above the shop. And my father remembers one day coming home from kindergarten, and the family activity was to sit around the kitchen table and to scrape off paint from a sign that, used to, that had hung above the business because police officers had come during the day and painted on it, don't shop from the dirty Jews. Can you imagine being five years old and having a sign with your family name on it, covered by graffiti that the police had put there? Evidently, just a few weeks after the paint incident, a Nazi officer came into the shop and said to my grandfather, Mr. Bachner, I like you. You're a good businessman. I like what you sell. Take my advice. Get your family out of here. You're not safe. Hitler's not just talking. He really means to do these things. Get out while you can. Well, my father didn't know it at the time, but my grandfather turned to my father and said, we're taking a business trip. And so my father walked out the door with a little backpack, with a book, an apple, and a stuffed animal. Didn't even turn around to say goodbye because he assumed they'd be back in a day or two. But it wasn't a business trip. They moved to Croatia, the other side of Europe. They rented an apartment. They wired back the money. And my father's mother, brothers and sisters met up with them there. But the war is about to begin and the war is about to spread. So the family, and that's my father on the far right, holding on to the uh, stroller, the family appeals to a cousin in Ohio, please get his visas for the United States. And somehow they were able to do so. They were some of the last Jewish refugees allowed into the United States before the Second World War, because when the Second World War started, entire ships of people were sent back literally to their doom. 
literally to their death. Our government, the American government, didn't want refugees, didn't want Jews entering into this country. My father, who literally turns 92 years old today, wanted me to tell you that the proudest day of his life was not when I was born. It was when he was brought into the United States Army. He said, finally, I had a chance to give back to this country that saved me and my family. On their way from Yugoslavia to the United States, they briefly stopped in Poland and said goodbye to a large family of Bachners that lived in Poland. My father realized at the time, realized later rather, he wasn't sure why he stopped in Poland. He now realized it was to say goodbye to people that they might not see again. And in this case, they didn't see them again. They didn't see them again because they were sent to a dot on this map, a map that I refer to as the map of death. These dots, and there are literally thousands of them, indicate the location of a concentration camp, a slave labor camp, or death camp. And I want to explain the difference. A concentration camp concentrates people. It's basically a prison. It's where the Nazis send people that they don't like. But the Nazis are not interested in keeping them as prisoners. The Nazis want these people dead. So they come up with a series of slave labor camps. And their logic is quite clear. We'll work these people as slaves. We don't have to pay them. We barely have to feed them. They'll contribute to our war effort, and then they will die. And the Nazis are quite pleased with this plan until they discover two significant problems. First, the Nazis complain that people are not dying fast enough. Somehow, barely feeding people and working them as slaves, they continue to cling to hope. They continue to survive. And secondly, the Nazis are very concerned about the emotional toll. No, not the emotional toll of the prisoners. They could care less about that. The emotional toll of the Nazis. The Nazis complain. It's exhausting. It's emotionally difficult to pull the trigger on a machine gun and plow down innocent men, women, and children that we have to look at. Please, find a way for these people to be eliminated, murdered, without our direct involvement. And that brings them to the idea of a death camp or death factory. These are the details. The Jews are told they're being relocated. No one is told they're going to be murdered. That would produce panic. They're told that they're going to be transported and they should bring with them one suitcase. They're packed into cattle cars, literally for days, without windows, without seats, without water, without bathrooms. And they are sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, Belzec, Chemno, Majdanek, Sobibor, or Treblinka, secret death factories located in occupied Poland. The Nazis certainly don't want these facilities on their soil, and most Jews live in Poland. Why spend time transporting them if they can be murdered where they're already living? Upon arrival, their belongings are immediately taken from them and sent back to German civilians. Their heads are shaved. And this accomplishes a few things. The Nazis say it slows the spread of disease, but more significantly, it dehumanizes them. It makes them no longer look like people. It's easier for them to be murdered this way. And their hair can be used for industrial purposes. Nothing from these people will be put to waste, including the metal filings in their teeth. At Auschwitz, they were given tattoo numbers to keep track of them, some would say to treat them as animals. Animals are treated much better as they're being led to slaughter. Those that could work were used as slaves, including to operate the extermination camp itself. Others contributed to the war effort. They were barely fed. Those to be killed were sent immediately to a building labeled showers. The Nazi guards dropped in Zyklon B gas pellets. A few moments later, everyone is dead. Jewish prisoners were forced to burn the bodies, remove all valuables, and then add the ash and bones to a pile. And today, if you were to go to one of the dots on the map that was a Nazi death camp, you would mostly see this. And yes, your eyes are working correctly. It's an empty field. 
So where are the buildings? Where are the crematoria? Where are the electrified barbed wire fences? Where are the gas chambers? Where are the barracks? Why is there almost nothing left? Because the Nazis knew that killing millions of innocent people was a war crime. They wanted to leave no trace or proof of their crimes. So when they were done killing people, and Frank's people, my people, my family, they destroyed the buildings, they plowed the land over, they buried the ashes in the bones of the people they gassed and burned, and in some cases, even built farmhouses to put over the pile of ashes and bones to indicate nothing to see here. But they miscalculated, and at least one significant death factory was left standing in a place called Birkenau, Poland. This is a picture that I took just a few years ago. It's a massive facility. This is what that field looked like during the war. This is what that field looked like from United States reconnaissance flights. And if you're wondering, were bombs ever dropped on the train tracks, on the crematoria? The answer is no. How did this place survive? Because the Nazis miscalculated. You see, they know at the end of 1944 that they're losing the war. It's only a matter of time. And so instead of stopping what they're doing, they're speeding it up. Because the Jews of Hungary had not yet been murdered. And they're murdering them 10,000s or more a day. And the Nazis know that when the snow and ice melts off the road, the Allies, the Russians will arrive and everything in Birkenau needs to be destroyed and dismantled just like they did in the other facilities. That was the miscalculation. The Russians didn't wait until spring. In January of 1945, the German Nazis discover the Russians are just a few miles from this location and they panic. They blow up as much as they can, they destroy as much as they can, and they realize there's a huge piece of evidence that they don't know what to do with. The tens of thousands of people that are working in the camp and are waiting to be murdered. They're marched back to Germany on foot. And today this is known as a death march. Very few people survived. They're walking in winter without adequate clothing. They're practically given no food. People starve to death, freeze to death, or are shot on the side of the road. The Russians arrive and they discover what the Nazis left behind. Barbed wire electrified fencing what's left of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And when I was first there, I discovered what the Russians discovered, a beautiful patch of trees. And I asked myself, why is there a park in the middle of hell? What is, why is this here? This is why it's there. This is what happened there. A sign in that clump of trees says, on their arrival in Auschwitz-Birkenau, most Jews were sent by the SS, the Nazis, for immediate death in the gas chambers. However, they were often forced to await their turn in this clump of trees if the gas chambers were full at the time. These trees were the overflow waiting area. And notice what it says at the bottom of the caption, the photo you're about to see taken by the SS, taken by a Nazi in 1944. This Nazi was not supposed to do this, but he broke rank. He took a roll of film, including the picture I'm going to show you next, and sent it back to his family in Germany, saying how proud he was of what he was doing. He was proud to take this picture. Proud to take this picture of people that in literally seconds are about to be murdered. And when I look at this picture of people in that clump of trees, I ask, did they know? Did they know they were about to die? And I tell myself, I don't think they knew. They're told they're being relocated. The building says showers on it. And which one of us, any of us, would know what the smell of burning human flesh smells like? And even if they did know, what could they have done? They're unarmed. They're surrounded by Nazi soldiers with machine guns and German shepherds. I don't think they knew. But we know, because their ashes and bones are still there. Tons of human remains that even 80 years later, when it rains, get into the local creeks, 
and waterways. And wherever there are these mounds of bones and ashes, these markers have been put up to the memory of the men, women, and children who fell victim to the Nazi genocide. Here lie their ashes. May their souls rest in peace. I'm often asked, why didn't they fight back? And the answer is, they did. It wasn't only in the Warsaw Ghetto that there was an uprising. Here, as the sign says, on October 7th of 1944, members of the Sonderkommando, the special detachment of Jewish prisoners who were forced to empty the gas chambers after a mass gassing and undertake the burning of the corpses, organized the only armed revolt that ever took place at Auschwitz. They knew they couldn't stop the Nazis, but they thought they could slow them down. They succeeded in destroying gas chamber and crematoria number four. More than 450 heroic prisoners who took part in the revolt were murdered by the Nazis, either during the revolt itself or the, subsequently for the purpose of retaliation. But it did slow them down. And as part of this particular act of resistance, Jewish prisoners worked with the Polish underground who were able to smuggle in a camera and took the only other role of film explaining, documenting exactly what happened at Auschwitz-Birkenau. These pictures were then shown to world leaders to alert them to what was happening, who then did absolutely nothing. But think about it. There's only two rolls of film from Auschwitz. One taken by a proud Nazi and one taken by a brave fighter in the Polish underground. And these are the pictures the Nazis never wanted you to see. These are the remains of the gas chambers. These are the remains of the crematoria. This is the remaining evidence of a genocide that killed millions of people 80 years ago. And then I was able to do something that my relatives were not. I was able to leave Birkenau. And when I did so, I traveled just a short distance away to the other side of the camp, a location known as Auschwitz. Today, Auschwitz is a museum. It's the most visited location in all of Poland. And the sign above the gate says, Arbit mach frei. Work will make you free. Nazi lies and propaganda. No matter how hard you worked, you were not going to be free. Only death would free you from Auschwitz-Birkenau. This location was originally built to house Polish troops. The Nazis took it over and turned it into a concentration camp. Why have you possibly heard of Auschwitz? For two reasons. One, it's still standing. One can go and see it, as compared to the empty fields I mentioned earlier. But secondly, you've probably heard of it because of what happened there. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest Nazi German concentration camp and death camp. Between 1940 and 1945, the Nazis departed, deported more than 1.3 million people to Auschwitz, more than a million Jews, but also Poles, Gypsies, Russian prisoners of war, prisoners from other ethnic groups. 1.1 million of these people died in Auschwitz. Approximately 90% of the victims were Jews, murdered by the Nazis in the gas chambers. Today it's a museum. You can even see the pellets dropped in by the Nazi guards of Zyklan B gas to murder these people. By the way, made by a chemical company that's still in operation in Germany today. You can even see the remains of a gas chamber. The Nazis built this one as an experiment to see if they could find efficient ways of mass murder. The Nazis ran out of time to destroy this evidence. Part of the museum is a huge book. It takes up an entire wall, and in it are four million known names of Jewish victims of the Holocaust. I found my stepfather's mother. I found my stepfather's younger sister. And then I turned to the page with my last name and found people with my name, my wife's name, and realized these are my relatives. Some of these were the people my father visited in Poland. These were the people I would never know because they were murdered.
this display grabbed my attention. It said, how did Jews cope during the Holocaust? During the Holocaust, the Jews found themselves utterly helpless, abandoned, and forsaken by most of the populations among whom they lived. Condemned to death by the German Nazis, they sought every possible way to survive and escape from them and their local collaborators. Clinging to life was the order of the day. Few rebelled, and most of those who did died in a hopeless struggle. Many tried to avert their fate by escaping, hiding, and fighting in the forests. These efforts produced manifestations of human brotherhood, mutual aid, and Jewish solidarity. Very few local citizens were ready to risk their lives to rescue Jews. Many of them been recognized as righteous among the nations. Very few Jews survived the Holocaust. About a year and a half ago, I traveled back to Poland with my family and members of the congregation and visited another dot on the map. This one known as Majdanek, right outside the city of Lublin. But the people who lived in Lublin said, we didn't know. We didn't know what was happening there. Sure, we saw busloads of people arriving every day and no one ever leaving, but we didn't know. We didn't know that there were barracks full of hundreds, thousands of people without any kind of bedding, full of bugs and disease. We didn't know. We didn't know the massive pile of shoes waiting to be shipped back to Germany that had been taken off the feet of prisoners. We didn't know. And they also said they didn't know about this because right outside of Majdanek is a huge mound. The Russians later built that top over it, but the mound was there and is still there. And it's a mound of human ashes and bones. This pile has been sitting there for 80 years. And still the people who live there say, we didn't know. These people were never even given a funeral. Their ashes just left on the ground. Part of my travels, I had a chance to go back to the towns that my grandparents grew up in. This is Tarnow, Poland, and what's left of the great synagogue of Tarnow, which the Nazis destroyed. Tarnow was 40% Jewish before the war. Today, there are no Jews that live there. Imagine going back to where your grandparents grew up. Maybe it's nearby, maybe it's far away. Picture yourself walking the streets of your grandparents' hometown. And imagine, what does it feel like to walk there and realize no one from your family lives there? No one from your family is left there. The question that I'm asked the most, can it happen again? Obviously, no one knows. But I'll answer you with the words of a survivor who said, it happened. Therefore, it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. I have some questions for you. I'd like you to think about what do we learn from these stories? What do we learn by reading Anne Frank or listening to the testimony of survivors? And how will you tell these stories when there are no more survivors? The survivors that are still alive are in their 80s and 90s. You are the last generation who will be alive while a survivor is still alive to tell their story. But it's been said, a witness to a witness becomes a witness. How will you become a witness to these stories? I've often been asked, why do some people say that they don't think it really happened? My answer is, those who minimize or deny the Holocaust are part of the hate that caused it. It is a denial of Jewish persecution and suffering. It is a denial of history and proven facts. To deny it is to avoid any responsibility for learning from it. Hitler didn't create anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish othering, and it certainly didn't end with him either. Hatred of Jews has not vanished. It's morphed. It's persisted. A survivor that I once heard speak said there were just four types of people. There were the victims. There were the perpetrators. There were the bystanders. 
and the upstanders. The bystanders literally said, I'm going to look the other way. They're not coming for me. I'm safe. I don't need to do anything. Which would we have been if we were alive 80 years ago? I certainly hope you would not have been a victim. I pray you would not be among the perpetrators. Would you be the bystanders, the people who looked the other way and did nothing? Or would you be an upstander, someone who'd be willing to risk your life, your safety, the safety of your family, to try to help people, save people, stop what was going on? The survivor asked this question, how do we as society move more people from being bystanders to being upstanders? My stepfather gave a number of survivor testimonies, and here is the last few minutes of what he shared in one of those. My message is Never, Never lose, lose hope. Life, Life is, made is made of all these, all these ingredients. ingredients. Uh, uh, the guy, the guy who is executed who wants to, to, to be executed hopes for a power. power. The seed hopes for a less of hand. You have to you have, have, to have hope, hope, hope and faith. And faith. We, do, we do with these, with these two things, things. You can you do, can a, do lot. a lot. You can, you do, can a do a lot, but you got, but you to, got be to be aware. aware. You got you to, got do, to what's do what's right. right. That's, my, That's message. my message. Thank you very, Thank you very much, much, Mr. Sinai. Okay, okay. I'm done. I'm done. I think there's a lot of powerful wisdom in what he shared. Hope and faith can get you very far in life, but you need to be aware. My stepfather was really addicted to the news, and I can understand why. As he said, it's life or death. You need to know what's going on. He'd wake up at 5 in the morning, immediately put on the radio, put on the news, read the newspaper. What's going on? Are we safe? But as he said, hope and faith and being aware are not enough. You need to do what's right. If you see something that's wrong, say something about it. If someone is being bullied, don't look the other way. Be an ally. Be a bystander. Don't allow people to be othered. I have actual artifacts from this period of time. On the left is an actual star that people had to sew on their clothing. And on the right is a German form that you had to fill out before you could go to school under the Nazis to make sure that no one in your family was non-Aryan. Think about that today. When we register for school, the school wants to know, have you been vaccinated? Back then, they wanted to make sure there was no Jewish or gypsy blood anywhere in you before you attended school. Questions and more questions. That's what we're left with. And I want to leave you with this. I've been asked, what do you think is the most important topic to teach young people? I'll give it to you in one word, tolerance. If all you're going to remember from today is one word, please remember this, tolerance. And if you want to take it to the next step, even better than tolerance, respect. Respect for diversity. Being educated and aware. Take action when you see that something is wrong. But ultimately, it's about tolerance for diversity. Think about your school. Think about your neighborhood. We're all different. Thank goodness for that. What a boring world it would be if we were all the same. What should be our response to the diversity of our school, our community, our state, our country, our world? Tolerance. Thank you so much for listening. If you have other questions, and I'm sure that you certainly could, please speak to your teacher. They will have my email address. I look forward to hearing from you, and I look forward to answering your question, and appreciate so much you listening to this presentation. Thank you.